At the southern end of England's long Pennine backbone is the Peak District. Easily accessible to millions of town and city dwellers, this was Britain's first national park. The park encompasses many landscapes. To the north, there is the open moorland of the Dark Peak. To the south, the limestone plateau of the White Peak. The fertile valleys are filled with grand houses and gardens, while below ground there's even more. We begin our rail journey with the Huddersfield Line, a major trans-Pennine corridor which skirts the northern edge of the National Park. From Manchester's Piccadilly Station, modern diesel multiple units run up the Tame Valley and are soon into the hills. Lost it. Lost it. 200 years ago, this was the heartland of Britain's industrial revolution. Fed by ample rain, the streams and rivers of these narrow Pennine valleys powered hundreds of mills and factories. As textiles declined, the surviving mills found new tenants, and a strong valley community has been maintained. At Upper Mill, there is a museum to tell the history of the valley. Above the town is the hilltop obelisk of pots and pans, and the once important village of Saddleworth, now a quiet backwater. Saddleworth's massive brooding church harks back to an earlier era. Gravestones speak from the past, and one recalls the grisly murder of Bill O'Jax and Tom O'Bills. To the east, the Chew Valley and Greenfield Brook cut deeply into Saddleworth Moor. This vast area of moorland is the dark peak at its wildest. The only inhabitants are sheep and grouse, and walkers can wander in solitude for miles. Back in the valley, some of the old ways have been revived. Running parallel to the railway is the Huddersfield Narrow Canal, recently restored and about to be reopened for traffic. At the end of the valley, the railway plunges beneath the Pennines into the Standage Tunnel. The Canal Tunnel opened in 1811, followed by the railway in 1849. On completion, it was the longest rail tunnel in the world. The trains emerge at Tunnel End, near the village of Marlson.
we follow the Cone Valley down through the weaving village of Golkar and on into Huddersfield. Built on cotton, Huddersfield is still a proud industrial town, with its confidence and importance reflected in the solid Victorian buildings. The open market was built in 1888 and its magnificent cast iron pavilion has been recently restored. High above the town is Castle Hill. This Iron Age hill fort has been occupied for over 3,000 years and is now topped by the Victorian Jubilee Tower and the Castle Inn. The beacon was part of a chain used to warn of invasion, and from here the views are superb. From Huddersfield, we take the Penistone Line heading south on a class 141 Leyland rail bus. Holmforth is still a typical Yorkshire town where traditional industries thrive amongst the dark gritstone terraces, mills and chapels. The first postcards came from Holmforth and the town featured in the early history of the cinema. At Denby Dale, the Dern Valley is crossed by an impressive viaduct. From here, it's a short detour to Cannon Hall. Once the manor of Cawthorn, the hall can be traced back to the Norman Conquest. Much of the current building dates from the 1760s and is a classic example of a Georgian country house. In 1951, Cannon Hall was bought by the County Borough of Barnsley and is now a museum with extensive collections of furniture, glassware and pottery. The walled gardens were also laid out in the 1760s when hundreds of different trees and shrubs were planted. These are now complemented by the bright colors of modern flower beds. The Kirklees Light Railway now operates over the old branch line to Clayton West. When it closed in 1983, 
This was the last of the branch lines constructed by the former Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway. This was built uh, as an extension of a hobby. I build the railway locomotives that you can see behind me and all the carriages. The railway is largely run by volunteers who come in and give their free time to uh, give enjoyment to the general public. The railway itself runs for two miles, shortly to be extended to four miles, and runs through superb South Pennine countryside. The locomotives were built over a period of about five years in a small garage workshop. The railway is relatively young and is still being added to all the time and probably will be added to for as long as we run it. The new rails were laid to 15-inch gauge, and for a while, the runaround loop at Cuckoo's Nest was the terminus of the line. Today, Fox runs around in the new station at Skelmanthorpe. The British rail line continues on to Penistone, where the Pennine Hills are decorated with wind generators. Trains from Manchester also serve Glossop on the western edge of the Peak District. This is a busy electrified line which once continued through the Pennines to Sheffield. Since ancient times, this has been a major Pennine crossing and the Romans built a fort here to guard it. Beyond the viaduct at Dinting, the line divides. Dinting's empty goods yard recently housed a railway preservation centre. 
The collection has since been moved to Keithley in Yorkshire, but before they went, there was a final weekend of steam. Today's trains are made up of class 304 and 305 electrical multiple units. They are fairly old now, as they were built back in 1960. A branch line from Dinting terminates at Glossop Station. The train must reverse in order to continue to Hatfield. Glossop itself is a picturesque old mill town which was developed by the 11th Duke of Norfolk. Field, the line comes to an abrupt end in the mouth of the Woodhead Pass. Beyond, the disused railway line has been redeveloped as a cycleway. This follows a string of reservoirs through dramatic scenery until the old Woodhead Tunnel prevents further progress. The redundant rail tunnel has not gone to waste. It now carries power cables beneath the Thurlston walls. The Manchester-Sheffield line cuts right through the heart of the Peak District. It divides the high moors of the Dark Peak from the limestone dales of the White. A Class 101 heritage unit pulls into the station at New Mills. Beneath the town, the river Goit has cut a deep gorge into the soft sandstone. This was the perfect site for early water-powered cotton mills, and the modern heritage center tells their story. Nowadays, the looms are silent, and New Mills Tours is an area for pleasant relaxation.
Beyond New Mills, the line curves east around Chinley Churn, and the Class 37 locomotive hauls a heavy load of limestone. Passenger trains are now all multiple units, such as the Class 158 BREL Express. These modern provincial diesels were built for the 1990s and have a maximum speed of 90 miles per hour. Cowburn Tunnel to pass beneath the flanks of the Kinder Plateau. Above, Ford Hall stands undisturbed, and the presence of a two-mile tunnel is indicated only by a single central air shaft. During construction, work proceeded down and then outwards from this point. On the eastern side, trains re-emerge in the Hope Valley. The village of Edale is a major walking centre, and Edale Station serves hundreds of walkers escaping into the surrounding hills. building in the village is this medieval farmhouse where accommodation was once shared by people and animals. It stands opposite the Nags Head and the start of the Pennine Way, Britain's most prized long-distance footpath. These walkers will have to travel 265 miles before a well-deserved rest at Kirk Yetholm in Scotland. On the opposite side of the valley is the Iron Age hill fort of Mam Tor. The name means Shivering Mountain, and massive landslips still take place. Further down the valley, the trains pass through Hope, which is served by a private branch line to Blue Circle Cement. The company has its own locomotives to shunt and haul in cement wagons. Not far from Hope, is the village of Castleton. It's dominated by the ruins of Peveril Castle, 
built in the 11th century to protect the royal forest of the peak and to control local mining rights. Peveril was an illegitimate son of William the Conqueror and was given complete control over a large tract of the Peak District. The rest of the village is mostly 17th century. Concealed behind these narrow streets and quaint stone houses is Cavedale. A small alleyway leads to a spectacular limestone gorge. It provides a footpath up onto the limestone plateau and encircles the rear of the castle. Even more impressive is Winnet's Pass, formed millions of years ago from a tropical coral reef. The pass contains many caves and is now a site of special scientific interest. Oh no, he's coming straight through. Bamford is a sturdy gritstone village and gateway to the attractive Derwent reservoirs. A modern fish farm has appeared on Lady Bower and a nearby pub commemorates the air crews of the 617 squadron who trained here before the famous Dam Busters raid on the Mone Dam in Germany. A Leyland rail bus pulls into Helsinki and is met by a westbound freight train. The village of Hathersinge provided the setting for Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Little John can also be found here, for Robin Hood's famous henchman is buried in the parish churchyard. The pagan traditions of the old Celts have not been totally forgotten here. Sacred water shrines live on in well-dressing ceremonies and Celtic stone heads are still used to ward off evil spirits. Behind the village is Stanage Edge, one of the most popular rock climbing crags in the country. This superb gritstone crag has climbs of all standards, and some of the world's greatest mountaineers started off here. Our last stop on this line is at Grindleford, from where we head south to Chatsworth House. Chatsworth is a magnificent 17th century Palladian mansion, the stately home of the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. This is considered one of the grandest country houses in England, with rich furnishing and fine works of art displayed in every room.
In the great dining room, there are Van Dykes, Georgian Silver and Blue John Crystal, while the sculpture gallery contains a profusion of marble figures and busts, complemented by a number of famous portraits, by, among others, Canova and Rembrandt. Outside the main features are the Emperor Fountain and the Cascade. The fountain's 290-foot jet of water makes it one of the highest in Europe. Water for both is supplied by natural pressure from four large reservoirs on the hillside above. The ornamental grounds were landscaped by Capability Brown and added to by Joseph Paxton. Features such as the massive rockery, required the invention of specialized new machinery for their construction. When a 13-year-old Princess Victoria came to Chatsworth, she was delighted by the willow tree fountain. It dates from 1692 and spurts water from its branches. At Grindleford, the train enters the Totley Tunnel, emerging three and a half miles away on the outskirts of Sheffield. The Buxton Line also heads out of Manchester, but follows the River Goit and the Coombs Valley. Beyond Whaley Bridge, there is more walking country through the green valleys and gentle moorland off the western edges. Surrounded by hills, the popular resort of Buxton is served by class 150 diesel sprinters. The fifth Duke of Devonshire built his elegant crescent around the waters of St Anne's Well. Buxton has a rich spa heritage. The thermal springs were discovered by the Romans and have been attracting visitors ever since. The Opera House is the focus 
for an annual music festival which brings performers from all over the world. In Victorian times, the railway brought increased prosperity to the town, as a result of which the pavilion gardens were laid out on the banks of the Infant River Wye. A miniature railway runs round the gardens. The locomotive appears to be steam, but it is in fact a small diesel engine. Poole's Cavern is also well worth a visit. This is a natural limestone cave, and archaeological digs have revealed that it was first inhabited 5,000 years ago by Stone Age man. Over 4,000 artifacts have been recovered, including a large amount of Roman pottery and some Roman coins. The cave was formed during the Ice Age as the River Wye found and enlarged fissures in the soft limestone rock. This formation is called Mary Queen of Scots Pillar and it's one of the most famous in the cave. Now, as you know, Mary Queen of Scots wanted the throne of England for Elizabeth I, imprisoned, and 14 years was spent in Sheffield. And on one of his journeys to the town in 1582, she was said to come into the cave, naming this formation. So ever since that time, it's been known as the Mary Queen of Scots pillar. Now, this is called the Flitch of Bacon, and as you can see, it was broken off on the end rather sadly. It happened in Victorian times, perhaps around about 1850, when people came in the cave unattended and did a certain amount of damage. And this is really why it was made into a show cave. Above the cavern are Grinlow Woods. Destroyed by lime burning in the 16th century, they were later landscaped by the Duke of Devonshire and are now part of the Buxton Country Park. On the summit of Grin Hill is Solomon's Temple, 
a Victorian folly built in 1895. At almost one and a half thousand feet, there are some impressive views. From Buxton, the Midland Railway's main line once ran on to Derby. The steam trains which once stood in the yard at Buxton are now long gone, but Peak Rail plans to reopen the whole route between Buxton and Matlock as a preserved steam line. Part of the line is still in use for freight, and Buxton's small motive power depot serves the quarry trains of nearby Peakdale. Heavy haulers, such as the powerful Class 60s, are needed to take limestone from the massive quarries of Peak Dale and Great Roxdale. The line beyond passes through the spectacular limestone scenery of Cheedale and Monseldale. At Monsell Head, the old Midland Viaduct is now used by walkers. The route tunnels beneath the Tudor country house of Haddon Hall. This is owned by the Duke of Rutland and is virtually unchanged since Tudor times. The terraced gardens also date from Tudor times and were resurrected early this century by the ninth Duke and Duchess. The rose collection is world famous and there's a strong feeling of harmony between house and garden. Rosely, the River Wye joins the Derwent. South of here, Peak Rail have restored the old Midland Railway line. Hartland prepares to make up her train at Darley Dale. This visiting West Country Pacific was built in 1950 for the southern region and rebuilt in 1960. She is normally found working a little further south at Loughborough.
the level crossing is closed to traffic and Heartland is free to depart for Matlock. Once at Matla, the Pacific runs round for the return to Dali Bay. Peak Rail also plays host to regular diesel dollars. D100 Sherwood Forester is a class 45, built in 1961 for service on this very line. This train is made up of class 03 and class 08 locomotives.
From Matlock, British Rail follows the River Derwent, tunnelling under high limestone cliffs to the spa resort of Matlock Bath. The town developed in response to the Victorian craze for hot springs. Cable cars provide access to the cliff-top pleasure gardens and amusement parks, and Ryber Castle now houses a small zoo. The old bathhouse is now home to the Peak District Mining Museum. Well, this is the Peak District Mining Museum, and in this area, we've had something like 3,000 years of lead mining, which went on from the Middle Bronze Age right through until about 30 years ago. It's been a very curious industry. Uh, the Romans were here. We've got uh, possibly 300 Roman ingots. And in medieval times, there must have been quite a rush when they began building the churches and the chapels for the lead for the roof. And then for about 250 years, Derbyshire became the world's biggest supplier of lead. Temple Mine belongs to this century because, quite simply, we couldn't let you go into workings which are much older, they're much too small. And in here they developed it for Fluor Spa, just three or four men working, first of all in the 1920s and then in the 1950s. And as you go through the mine, you'll be able to see how they worked in the 1950s. A few miles away are the most impressive remains of the lead mining industry the eerie ruins of Magpie Mine. At Cromford, the valley opens up again. The village was once full of handloom weavers and knitters, and when the water wheel turns on Greyhound Pool, all the old world magic returns. Here, Arkwright's cotton mill is being restored as a monument to the inventor of the factory system. It's a very interesting fact about Arkwright. He really came from almost nothing. And by the time he died, Richard Arkwright had been knighted by King George III. He was the first commoner to be knighted. And we hope within the next four or five years to restore this first mill, which is the very first successful water-powered cotton spinning mill in the whole world, uh, to its former glory. Further down the valley, we catch a steam train on the main line. A special run by the National Railway Museum's Duchess of Hamilton. Last stop is at the National Tramway Museum at Kreitsch. These electrically powered vehicles once provided cheap urban transport for Britain's towns and cities.
the setting is authentic too, and visitors can enjoy all the sights and sounds of the tramway era.